This is the state and local government online course. For this video, we're going to be combining chapters 11 and 12, looking at local governance and metro politics. So, as far as power goes, two primary theories tend to dominate the Western democratic systems. One is called the power elite theory, where we are looking at a group of rulers and the people that are being ruled and a small privileged group that of course may have gotten there legitimately through elections but they are a small group of local elected officials that are carrying out the decisions of the elite and the elite have put themselves in this position for that purpose of making those decisions that would most likely either improve the benefits of the city at large or the benefits of the economic development. So what we see is these business and professional interests are linked to local development and growth. That seems to be one of the primary drivers of city governance is to just get people to work and make the economy working smoothly. The pluralist theory is another theory that particularly on the federal level we see that particularly corporate interests are very prominent in pressuring government policymakers in order to get laws that are passed that are beneficial to their groups. So what we have here with the pluralist theory is simply that policy is driven by a diversity of competing interest groups. And they are very disproportionate in their power, that's for sure. And now we're going to be looking at it here more on the local level, where compromises, marketing, combination, and a little bit more hands-on and uh, fast turnaround results on the local level in order to get things done. It might be more common on the local city level. These are the groups that uh, are ranked by their level of activity and influence, particularly in local politics. Interestingly enough, the Chamber of Commerce is also by far the most prominent spender on lobbying for federal government. So they are working themselves all the way down. Chamber of Commerce represents the small businessman, so there's hardly a town in America that doesn't have a Chamber of Commerce office, even if it's just a little room with some uh, pamphlets in it. But we've got neighborhood groups, developers, task forces, political parties, nonprofits, churches, and professional groups and national businesses a little bit further down on the list here as far as their influence in local politics. Looking at citizens groups, the, uh, of course, uh, this is a survey showing the percentage of people surveyed that agree the statement is a good description of local politics. And so by a, a majority here, interest groups are active in city politics. That's fairly much of a given there. But we also see that there are some perhaps biased views as well that business groups get what they want. Well, second highest percentage in this thing here. Election officials oppose the aims of this particular organization. So as you can see with public surveys, you might be getting a lot of perceptions based on people's own particular self-interests. We've talked a little bit about how designation of property is a very important function of city governments and exercising of those property rights. We've already talked about the zoning laws and regulations is one of their primary responsibilities as far as commercial development, residential development, and industrial development. State and local governments have this power of what is called eminent domain, which is actually in the U.S. Constitution, that the federal government has this power, that uh, if there is a public purpose for which this land is needed for the public good, then the local government can take that property if they are giving 
the owner fair compensation. So that's a big statement right there. There are people that will oppose that and may never be able to work out a fair compensation, which means that the city might even have to regroup and go a different direction. But a very interesting ruling by the, the U.S. Supreme Court, this is uh, New London, I believe, in Arizona, ruled in favor of the city that was promoting economic de development. So in other words, they were trying to take property in order to build an economic development, which is not what you would typically think of as a public purpose, such as a, a electric power grid or you know, power lines or something like that. So we see that because that it fulfilled an economic purpose, we got the Supreme Court to rule in favor of the city in saying that improving the economic development of the city fulfilled a public purpose, but of course invited restrictions. Looking at the, the structures of city councils of the 20 largest cities, we see that there's not necessarily a correlation between the size of the city and the size of their central city council. But clearly, some of the biggest cities have quite a few of uh, city council members. But interestingly enough, Indianapolis down here on the list has 29 city council. We talked about at large, and we see there are several cities that do not have any at large elections, which means they are divided up into districts and representatives are elected from their districts. So there gives you the uh, the number that elected from this here you've got a mixture you have five at large in jacksonville and 14 elected from districts metropolitics is looking at the, the larger picture of cities and the surrounding suburban areas and the politics involved so we've got lots of challenges here urban sprawl is one where we've got lots of people coming in towards the urban areas because there's more jobs there, there's more things to do and people to meet. And so urban sprawl is, is consuming up land and we're, we're seeing that there's more dependence on the automobile for this urban sprawl because you've got longer commutes. So that could contribute to Greenhouse gases, so there's got lots of things going on here with, with urban sprawl. Impact fees are charged to developers in order to raise revenue, in order to uh, get this development approved, and also would go through a review process as far as the where the development is and what you know how it's going to expand the uh, the city's responsibility. Green belts are where the city sets aside land for just uh, wild life area, perhaps parks, walkways. Smart growth is just a concept of trying to get a handle on it in a reasonable manner. The book talks about 10 principles of smart growth there. So healthy mix compact building design so you can of walkable neighborhoods. So you can look through this list and that gives you some ideas as far as what states may be looking at to try to make their growth a little bit smarter. Also, we've got the issue of shadow governments and these are organizations that are not official governments, but they act like they are with respect to their jurisdictions. One of the types is the what we call private enterprise governments and homeowners associations is a very typical example of that, where people get together and form an association that uh, you know upkeeps the neighborhood, has perhaps some security measures, may even do some improvements by charging all the residents in that division a fee, and the HOA uses that money for security improvements. And public-private partnerships is where the public sector is joining with 
someone in the private sector to create development corporations to where there's a little bit more interaction and guidance as to what is going to get built. We also have what are called BIDs, business investment districts, that are set aside for investment to create businesses in those regions. And there are various subsidiaries of state government, such as planning commissions, which are typically appointed or selected to look ahead at what might be needed in this particular area of growth. Regional governance is something that we look at several cities across an area. You may, they may come together and have regional motivations to do that, perhaps as far as traffic or conservation. So what you're doing is, is creating another level of authority that may not necessarily have jurisdiction over a city, but there is some coordination there and obviously some state guidance as far as how we want to coordinate our roadways and our traffic projections in this region that connects three to four fairly big cities that are growing and may have more reasons to coordinate, cooperate. This, of course, could result in multi-jurisdictional problems is who's handling what, who coordinates with who as far as the cities or that regional government. And again, the ultimate goal here is to be a little bit more efficient rather than have multiple jurisdictions all doing their own thing, coordinate them into a regional governance association that can do the central planning for that whole area. There are some motivations to consolidate the city with the county, particularly if the city is large enough that it takes up pretty much the whole county. It might make sense to do that, to have a single area-wide authority that the jurisdiction of the county is the same as the city. So that, just like with any corporation that wants to get bigger and bigger, you get economies of scale. There's about 33 city-county consolidations in the United States. And it's still in the, I could say, experimental phases. It doesn't necessarily reduce costs. And it might make things a little bit less accessible if you're going through a larger entity in order to try to get things done, rather than if it was broken apart, you could get things done through smaller subdivisional jurisdictions. Now, the regional coordination, there have been some councils of governments set up to where you have area-wide planning, which could look at this urban sprawl situation, uh, even incorporation and annexation, certainly traffic planning in that region, and also could result in the ultimate consolidation of services so that you have one water department that handles this whole region rather than three different water departments. It uh, would certainly save administrative costs, be a little bit more efficient in theory. Sharing of services at same costs in order to probably make them more consistent across that region. Housing is another situation where cities are, are, are dealing, particularly large cities, are dealing with homeless coming out of recession and trying to have enough affordable housing in their city. So housing finance agencies are being set up in order to try to make financing of homes more affordable, getting government subsidies in order to provide more housing at lower cost for more people, vouchers and Section 8 type uh, programs give people assistance where they can use that money to go pay for housing. Nonprofit corporations are springing up in order to try to provide housing for low income people in particular and not make a profit at it. 
infrastructure is, as with each year, is a growing concern because throughout the United States, cities are facing lots of infrastructure that's getting old. Water systems getting close to 100 years old. Even subway systems getting old, needing maintenance, perhaps even some up, updating, maybe even some replacement. Bridges. The American Society of Civil Engineers gave the United States a D grade in maintaining of the bridges throughout the United States. Doesn't mean that bridges are going to start collapsing, but they they may have a few structural problems that are going to need attention. And state funding is problematic because states cannot run a deficit, so they would have to raise the revenue in order to provide those funds for their cities. That's why federal government subsidies are also attractive. For state financial support, we see that grants, which they don't have to pay back, they have to apply for those. We have tax revenue that is dedicated to a certain thing, so citizens can determine where that particular you know, input of tax, where that's going to go, perhaps through referendums. Loans, of course, have to be paid back and uh, interest paid on that. And bonds are a way to raise money for construction projects, for example, that you ra raise the money through selling of bonds that's an investment for the bondholders. And that money is used to make that capital improvement. And then the the revenue that's generated from that capital improvement would be used to pay off the bondholders. Privatization is is um, kind of outsourcing things out to a private firm. Toll rows are not a perfect form of privatization because toll rows are, have to be authorized by the state, and then they use these revenue bonds to raise money and build roads and then they collect tolls on it in order to pay back the bondholders and maintain the roads and even use that for future projects down the road, no pun intended. The concept of new urbanization has been around for quite a while that's looking at breaking large urban areas up into smaller com communities where everything is the intent is to put everything right there in one place. You live in the same area where you work. You can potentially walk to work or take a, a Segway or bicycle to work. And environmentally sensitive is, is also one of the goals here. Uh, obviously, not having cars would be more beneficial to the environment. And so that, that's been around for quite a while. It's very difficult to to break cities up that are already that have been in place for so long or even build new neighborhoods that are catering to this type of thing. We also see that Americans are moving generally from the rural areas to the urban areas. That's part of the reason for the urban sprawl because more people are coming to the urban centers because that's where the better paying jobs are, that's where the social interaction is. And people that get educated, that want better jobs, the better jobs are going to be in the urban areas. Rural America is kind of shrinking up somewhat. And there may need to be some sort of reform to incentivize people to move back to the smaller towns or move back to the country. That would take some very creative programs that what would attract people to move back out, what kind of jobs would you be able to set up, and also if funds are drying up in the, the rural areas, then some sharing of revenue through tax code reform would spread the funds out to the smaller towns, rural areas as well, and rather than have this land use planning, just a city function, they could convert that to a statewide function that could actually look at trying to plan ahead for the rural areas as well as the cities. And the incentives, that's the, uh, that's the 
question is what you would offer, what kind of free services would you offer in order to get people to either stay in the rural areas or move out to the rural areas? Could there be land offerings of that sort? We also see that rural development councils may be an idea towards coordinating with the federal, state, and local governments in order to try to, you know, incentivize a little bit more population to the rural Americas. This is the website resources for chapters 11 and 12.